All right, welcome back to the channel. This is my second video about heating my house with a wood-burning fireplace insert. So in the last video, I covered how I installed the wood-burning insert. I've definitely learned a couple things about how to heat my house effectively with it, and I wanted to cover uh, 10 tips that I've learned since I have started heating my house with wood. So let's start at the beginning, splitting. So in this video, I'm not gonna cover chainsaws or cutting up a wood or logging or any of that stuff because that's like a whole nother can of worms. But even if you do get your firewood delivered and you don't actually get it from your own land, you are still gonna need a splitting maul. This is a Fiskars X27. Um, I did quite a bit of research on splitting mauls. I went with this one because of a couple features on it that I thought were pretty interesting. One is the uh, the handle here is a polymer. It supposedly has a lifetime warranty and it's unbreakable. But you can see here, it's got a bunch of scuffs on it. Um, I don't think this thing's ever gonna break, so pretty happy with that. The other thing is the blade itself has some Teflon on it to help it dig in a little deeper and reduce friction. But it also has this little lip here. So as you're swinging, it acts as a pivot, speeds up the splitting mall and gives you more power. It's important that you split the wood before you put it on the rack because that's gonna help it dry. Which brings us to the second tip. brings us to wood racks. Behind me I have two wood racks that I knocked out with some 2x4s and cinder blocks. I also have this metal one here that was purchased on Amazon. I'll leave a link in the comments below. This is fine. I don't have any problems with this. It's worked great, but I did have some cinder blocks sitting around and if you just use some 2x4s that I repurposed from a different project, you just throw a couple screws in there. The 2x4 wedges into the hole of the cinder block and it's very strong and very cheap and very quick to knock these out. So it's now mid-January. I've been burning wood almost every day since late October, and you can see that that rack is almost empty and this rack is completely empty. So I've gone through probably about a face cord and a half, almost two face cords of wood. When you set these up, the important thing is to put them so that they're facing the sunlight. You want as much sun beating on the wood as possible to help dry them out. These ones I have next to the house. Technically, you're not supposed to put them next to the house. They can cause uh, rodent and pest problems with termites and mice and all sorts of stuff. But what I've done here is I've put a gap uh, between the house and the rack, and then I'm trying to keep the leaves from collecting under there. Really, I put this here out of convenience so I can come from my deck at night, grab some wood, and come right back inside without having to trudge through the snow. But in order to season this wood properly and get it dry enough to burn, it's really gonna take almost a year, probably at least six months. One of the things that is really important is to make sure your wood is dry. And for that, you need a moisture meter. These are about 10 bucks. They just have two metal little prongs here. You hit the on button and jam it into the wood and it's gonna tell you how wet your wood is. Now you can burn wood that's still wet, but the problem with that is you're gonna create more creosote, which is that black tar-like substance and that's gonna build up inside of your chimney liner and if you get enough of that in your chimney liner it can actually catch fire and you can have a chimney fire and a house fire it's uh, it's bad news so really the safest thing to do is to only burn dry wood ideally you don't even want bark on it but you know good practice is to just use a moisture meter and make sure that it's below 20% so you don't have to get this model they're all pretty much the same thing you just turn them on take these two sharp pointy things and jam them into the wood and see what it says 14% 10%. So as long as it's under 20%, you're probably pretty good. I highly recommend you get a moisture meter, but if you don't have one, here's the poor man's way to do it. Just take two pieces of wood and clang them together. It sounds like a clave or something, really loud. If they're wet, it's gonna make a thunk sound. That's because there's still a lot of moisture in the fibers, but these are pretty much musical instruments at this point. They're good to go. The other thing you're going to need is kindling to get the fire going in the morning. Right here, I have a kindling area. This is a kindling cracker. Um, I'll put a, a link down below, but this is just a little cast iron thing where you throw a small piece of wood on here, hit it with a hammer, and you get some nice small pieces of wood to help start a fire. I took the really small pieces, I put them in a Tupperware container here. When it was still nice out, I left this open and just put this in the sun to help it dry out, but all these little pieces are great for starting fires. The other thing I did was I built a kindling box. I'll show you how I built this. This is pretty quick and easy, so let's jump to that real quick.
All right, so that didn't take too long. Pretty easy, just stapled this thing together. It doesn't need to be really heavy duty. Um, what I am going to do is try to weatherproof this thing a little bit using that Japanese uh, preservation technique, Sudiban. I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But basically, you just torch the wood and what that does is it will tighten up the cells uh, on the exterior of the wood, which doesn't allow water to get into it as well. So we're just going to go ahead and char this whole thing. Okay, so now we're inside. I've got a couple more tips for you. You're gonna need an ash bucket. I picked this one up. Uh, it's just something non-flammable to throw yesterday's ashes in case they're still hot. You're also gonna need some fireplace tools. I suggest instead of buying them at Menards or Home Depot or whatever, just check out eBay or Etsy. You can get some super cool mid-century stuff for about the same price. This is all Danish teak and brass. I think it's way more attractive than the stuff you get made in China from Menards, so. Check that out somewhere. Now I'm going to start a fire. I'll show you how I do it. So there's a couple orientations you can put your firewood. It really depends on your exact fireplace insert on what's best. This is called north-south, where it runs from the front of the fireplace insert to the back. And this is called east-west. Regardless of what you do, you do want to try to space some air underneath any piece of wood in here because fire is all about breathing. When I'm cutting up trees, I save the branches and put them in one spot to dry out. I use that as kindling. This is a stick of fat wood. It lights really easily. Super oily wood here. So the other thing when you are first starting your fire, just keep your door cracked a little bit. The airflow will rush into this gap here and help blow the fire on all the other pieces of wood. Generally, I keep the door open like this for about two to three minutes. It really gets everything going pretty nicely. It's been a couple minutes of this fire blasting and all these other pieces with this door cracked. So now I'm gonna shut the door and I'm still gonna leave the air vent or the air control all the way open for another few minutes until this really takes hold. And then I'm gonna start to choke it off. All right, so a few minutes later, even with the air control all the way open, you can see the fire has started to die down and kind of in a bunch of different places. One thing I suggest you do is get a pair of welding gloves and then you can just grab stuff and move it around. But that's going to allow me to just grab the big chunks of wood and elevate it and help things keep burning. The other thing I can recommend if you have a glass viewing screen like this is just get some wood stove glass cleaner. This will clear up any of the soot or carbon that builds up on the glass here. I also want to talk about the temperature. So a lot of places sell these little magnetic thermometers that help you keep an eye on your, your insert. This is kind of a double walled box as I went over in the previous video, so it's not super accurate, but realistically the heat should transfer eventually even to the outside. But the goal here is you want to keep your fire pretty hot. You don't want to get too hot, but if you burn too cool, you're going to make more creosote. It's just going to be a less efficient burn. So the goal is to try to get this thing as hot as possible right away because the sooner it's hot, the sooner it's efficient. So you can see here that even though this fire has been going for about five minutes now, this thermometer hasn't even moved yet. That's okay. Um, I'm gonna come back to this in about mm, 20 minutes and see where this thermometer's at. All right, it's about 20 minutes later. You can see that the temperature is now in the optimum area. What I'm gonna do now is start limiting the oxygen. And also it's just help heat the house. I have a blower, which is down here. I'm gonna turn the blower on and help push air through here. And when you run the blower, it will be cooling the whole insert. So if this thing ever gets hot, the blower should turn on automatically. To use the wood most efficiently, you let this burn all the way down to the coals, but then it's kind of hard to get stuff going again. So when you're reloading your fireplace, what I like to do is just take the uh, scooper here and I smash all the coals to the left and right side of the firebox, leaving a valley. And you can just throw your wood in there and you get a lot of airflow right underneath those pieces and they'll light up really quick here. Once they're lit and the fire has a bed of coals, I'll just take the air control and choke her all the way down. That should be good for three to four hours. All right, this last thing I wanted to cover was called banking coals. Ignore the fire still going on in the back of the firebox. This is what you can do to avoid having to light a fire the next morning. 
So you take your shovel and you scoop all the coals into a big pile here in the front of the firebox. Once you get them in a good pile, you take your ash bucket and you cover your coals with ash. It seems kind of counterintuitive and weird, but you basically starve it of oxygen and keep it really hot. So tomorrow morning, I should be able to just put some kindling on here and the fire should start without needing a fire starter. So there you go, that's banked. We'll get back to this tomorrow. One other thing, if you're gonna be banking coals, make sure you turn your blower off because that's gonna draw heat out of the smoke box and everything. So what we wanna do is keep the heat in there. So turn your blower off and then you don't wanna give it a ton of oxygen, but you don't wanna starve it either. So just put it in the middle somewhere. That seems to work. So, all right, see you guys tomorrow morning. I'm going to see if the coals are still banked. Oh yeah. So all you do is build a fire on those coals and it should start right up. Well, I'm gonna cheat and use the lighter. Alright, well that's how you bank coals. Alright, that about wraps up this episode. Hopefully some of these tips and tricks save you guys some money and help keep your house warm. And if you like this video, be sure to check out some of my other stuff. Most of it is not related to burning wood. Most of it's actually related to burning gasoline and fixing things that burn gasoline. Other than that, stay safe and thanks for watching. Cheers!